Do you like to stumble around blindfolded in an unfamiliar place? You don't know what's going on or where you're at. Then you should read The Sound and the Fury by William Faulkner. And before we get to the review, we're going to answer one question. Did I enjoy this read? And the answer is no. Welcome to Whiskey and Literature. I'm your host, Captain Mike, and I'm reading and reviewing 52 books in 52 weeks. And while we're turning those pages, we're sipping those bottles of finely distilled spirits. This is my 26th book review of the year so far, The Sound and the Fury by William Faulkner. And before we get to the book, let's talk about William Faulkner very briefly. William Faulkner, an American author born in 1897, died in 1962. He wasn't universally acclaimed by the critics of his day. In fact, even some of his early works were rejected by the publishers. But today he is considered one of the greatest authors of all time and certainly the greatest of Southern literature. The Sound and the Fury. This was originally published in 1929. It's a Southern Gothic novel. I bought my copy at the Goodwill bookstore for $3, a pretty nice deal. I also listened to it on Audible. It was read by uh, Grover Gardner for eight hours and 32 minutes. My book is 321 pages long. Okay, let's talk about the style of The Sound and the Fury. There are four main parts from four different narrators, and they often cover the same events from different perspectives. And the narrators being unreliable in imposing their own biases and judgments upon the events that occur make a true understanding of the events related in the novel difficult. We have frequent time shifts in the novel that are jarring and confusing to the reader. The first part is especially difficult as the narrator is mentally handicapped and often shifts from his childhood to adulthood, even in the same sentence sometimes. The stream of consciousness type of narrative style, this inner dialogue, it's employed throughout the novel, oftentimes for long stretches. And while this is considered a great work, it is definitely a difficult read. And I agree, it is a difficult to read and difficult to enjoy. Okay, let's go through some of the characters in the novel. First, we have Jason Compson III. He's a family patriarch and an alcoholic. Then we have Caroline Bascom Compson. She's the matriarch. She's a manipulative, hypochondriac, and she doesn't seem to care about any of the kids except Jason. Then we have Quentin Compson. He's the oldest child and he commits suicide due to his inability to deal with his father's influence and his sister's promiscuity. We have Benjamin Benji Compson. He's a mentally disabled fourth kid and Caddy's the only other child that actually shows him any affection. And we have Candace Caddy Compson. She's a second kid, strong-willed, and we actually never see her perspective in the novel. We only see her through the eyes of the other characters. We have Jason Compson IV. He is openly racist, unable to manage his finances, and he steals the support payments that Caddy sends for her daughter, Miss Quinton. And Miss Quinton Compson. She's Caddy's daughter who lives with the Compson family after the divorce. And then we have Dilsey. She is a black maidservant who stays with and witnesses the decline of the Compson family. And her sons and grandson are the caretakers of Benji. There are a few other characters throughout the novel, but they're bit players and relatively unimportant. So let's move on now to the plot of The Sound and the Fury. Okay, it is almost impossible to give a synopsis of the plot of the story. The novel only covers four days of time, but the characters frequent ruminations and memories from times past flesh out the rest of the story. So let's go ahead and talk about the four parts and then share my thoughts about the sound and the fury. The first part covers April 7th, 1928, and this is Benji's narration. And this is characterized by frequent jumps in time periods from when Benji was young to when he's an adult. This part takes place during one day, but it covers 30 years of Compson family history. One of the easiest ways 
to tell what is the time period is by who is Benji's caretaker. Because that's a general, generational occupation. They were all Dilsey's sons and grandson. This is the most challenging part of the book to read. It's also the most honest, as Benji's simple-mindedness carries no biases or judgments to shade his recollection of the events. And we get a feel for Benji's three obsessions. Fire, the golf course, which is adjacent to their property, and his sister, Caddy. Then we skip back in time 18 years to June 2nd, 1910. And this is Quentin's narration. And we have two threads that are woven within here, both Quentin's current, his time in Harvard, and then his memories and his flashbacks to his earlier time. And if you've already read Absalom, Absalom, you'll be familiar with Quentin and with Sharif. Quentin, he's a Southern gentleman, and he's obsessed with his sister's virginity, her purity, and he feels like it's his job to be his protector. Quentin and his father have differing opinions on this matter that cannot be reconciled. At one point in the narrative, Quentin confronts and gets beat down by someone who he suspects of impregnating his sister, Caddy. And at one point, he actually tells his father that he, Quentin, and Caddy committed incest, but his dad didn't believe him. Caddy, she marries Herbert, who realizes after the marriage that she's pregnant by, by someone else's child and sends her away. Herbert had also offered a job to Jason, a nice lucrative job, but he rescinded that offer after he sent Caddy away, which really turned Jason bitter and set up part three. And as Quentin wanders around Harvard, he comes across a little immigrant girl who he ends up spending the day with before committing suicide. Okay, now we're on to the third part, April 6th, back to 1928. And this is a day before the first part, before Benji's narration. And this is the first part of the novel that is fairly linear. We see Jason, he leaves work one day to go hunt for Miss Quinton, who has not gone to school and she's left with some guy from a traveling show. Jason is the source of the family's financial means by this time. He supports them by working in town at a store or a shop and he supports himself by stealing the payments that Caddy sends to him to take care of Miss Quinton. He uses these funds to keep himself a mistress and as money to lose at the stock market. Jason is super bitter and he blames Caddy for his lost opportunity to work with Herbert. We really see into the dysfunctional dynamics of the Compson family in this in this part. And then we roll into the last part of the novel, April 8th, 1928. There's no central or main narrator of this part, but we mainly focus on Dilsey, the, uh, the head servant of the house. And it's Easter Sunday and she's taken her family and Benji to the black church. Dilsey has been mistreated for decades, but despite that, she's been loyal to the Compson family and has witnessed their decline through the years. And meanwhile, back at the Compson house, the family realizes that Miss Quinton has run away with the carnival worker. And Jason realizes that she has stolen from him thousands of dollars that he stole from her, from the caddy's payments for her. He tries to enlist the help of the sheriff or police, but then he realizes he'll have to implicate himself in the theft in order to get their help to explain to them where he actually got that money from. So he just goes out and searches for Miss Quentin by himself. He can't find her, gets beat up, and he just writes her off as lost. Meanwhile, back at the family, Luster, Dilsey's grandson, is allowed to drive Benji home from the church in the horse and carriage. But this turns out disastrously when he turns left instead of right, and Benji goes into hysterics. Jason rushes in to save the day. He slaps Luster and then he punches Benji and he breaks his flower while screaming, shut up. Thus ends the sound and the fury. Okay, so what are my thoughts on this novel? While I have read many books in my life, I'm just a guy that likes to read. 
I'm not trained in the literary art. I feel sometimes like I am an amateur painter looking at the works of the greats. Well, maybe there's something that I'm missing. I just do not find value in Faulkner's works. I did listen to a significant portion of The Sound and the Fury on Audible. And honestly, I regret that now. I absolutely believe that listening to Audible or audio books is a valid way of it experiencing novels and books. I mean, through almost all of history, we have received stories and histories through listening. The rise of this solo reader reading a book, that's, that's a recent phenomena. However, I think this narrative style, this stream of consciousness, this inner dialogue, certainly with Faulkner, it begs to be read and not listened to. However, I did appreciate Virginia Woolf's stories on Audible, so maybe it's just Faulkner. And I do understand that one of my books later in this year is Ulysses, and that's also the same kind of narrative style, so I am not gonna listen to that at all on Audible. And guys, when I started reading this book, I, I thought Benji was a dog. Like, I was so confused about what was going on. Between his frequent jumps in time, people were picking up in the way they were talking to him. I really just thought, is this a dog or what is going on? Usually I read about the books before I read the books and I didn't get to it before I started The Sound and the Fury. And I'm telling you, if you like to read and you want to delve into the classics perhaps for the first time, I would really encourage you to do some research in the book or about the book and even about the author before you start reading these classics. It really makes a difference and will be less frustrating to you in your reading. Now I get with this narrative style, the plot is not the point of this book. It's more about each character's perceptions of the actions that happen to them and how they reflect and react to these actions. Their interpersonal relationships and how these affect them, how these change and mature and even devolve over time, that's really what we're interested in. However, Faulkner's jarring jumps from perspective and period make it so difficult to follow this narrative, it's hardly worth the effort. And if you can get through all that, I felt like the plot, the underlying story in The Sound and the Fury is less compelling than Absalom, Absalom. Okay, was there anything that I liked about The Sound and the Fury? Well, the last two parts were fairly linear, and I think they did showcase Faulkner's ability to weave a tale. I just wish he had done it more. I did also enjoy the scene with Quentin and the little immigrant girl that he spent that day with. At one point, I think he referred to her as, as a dirty little girl, which were almost the exact same words that he used towards Caddy. Like, it wasn't even a subtle allusion. And aside from the nod to Caddy, I just enjoyed that entire scene. Honestly, if you really want to, or you're required to read a William Faulkner, I would pick Absalom Absalom over The Sound and the Fury. If you just want to read a stream of consciousness type novel, go with Virginia Woolf. And those are my thoughts. All right guys, on to the star rating, and I judge all my books on five criteria. We'll look down here at my notes and see what we have for the sound and the fury, and it's not good. All right, uh, initial response. How do I feel as soon as I finish the book? I only gave it a two, because it did pull itself up a bit in the last two parts, slightly. All right, number two, recommendation. How likely am I to recommend this book? One, I'm not recommending this book to anybody. Three, style. Did I enjoy the writing style? Also a two. I think we've gone over that already. Four, plot and structure. How engaged was I in the story? And you know what? It's getting a one. I didn't care one whit what was going on on the next page. Because I wasn't even sure what happened on the previous page. Five, characters. Were they relatable, believable, engaging? You know, I actually gave it a three. Um, while I didn't necessarily like the characters, I thought they were, they were fairly well done. And sixth, Audible. For those books I listened to on Audible, how was the production 
and I gave it a 3. Okay, that's only 12. And 12 divided by 6 is 2. Two stars for The Sound and the Fury by William Faulkner. Okay, my friends, thank you for sticking with me. If you enjoyed the video, like it. It's free. Subscribe to see more of my content. I do both book and whiskey reviews. For now, my friends, I hope you're reading something good and drinking something great. Turn those pages and stay thirsty. Cheers. Mm -hmm.